Hello, Matthew Bell with Alzheimer'sProof.com, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about how an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor drug works. In reading about pharmaceutical grade Alzheimer's interventions, Alzheimer's drugs, you are almost certainly going to come across the term acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Sometimes these drugs are called cholinesterase inhibitors. Apparently, choline and acetylcholine are chemically close together as their names would suggest. In another video where I actually outline six different FDA approved pharmaceutical interventions, you will discover in that video, if you are unaware, that five out of the six approved interventions are in this classification, this acetylcholinesterase inhibitor drug class. One of the drugs is no longer widely prescribed. As far as I can tell, it's been discontinued. That drug would be Tacrin. Its brand name is Cognex. Apparently, it is no longer prescribed, but it was an acetylcholinesterase inhibiting drug. It was one of the first. I think it might have been actually the first one approved. Currently, there are three drugs on the market that specialize in this acetylcholinesterase inhibiting action. The first one widely prescribed is the brand name Aricept. Its chemical name is Denepazil. Secondly, brand name Exelon, chemical name Rivastigmine. And the third one, variously termed Reminil and Razidine, the chemical name on that one is Galantamine. Now I have a video again where I get more in detail in terms of these drugs where they were developed, what company developed them, and what they are used for, what stages of Alzheimer's, some of the side effects, and some other information. But each of those four, the three that are in wide circulation that I just named, as well as Cognex, so Cognex, Aricep, Exelon, and Razadine, all have as their primary action this acetylcholinesterase inhibiting action. A fifth drug, Namzeric, actually combines two different actions. One is acetylcholinesterase inhibition, and the second is NMDA antagonism. That will be left for a different video, but in this video, I wanted to try to get a better handle on what it is to be an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Now, the brain has a network of nerve cells, also called neurons. I'm going to make this, first of all, as a disclaimer, I am not a medical researcher, I am not a physician, I do not, I do not have any special medical training, I am simply a layman trying to get a handle on these things, and so take my explanation for what it's worth, but it is important to at least get a passing familiarity with this classification of drug because it is so prominent, not only in terms of pharmaceutical interventions, but also in terms of some herbal supplements which also purport to have an acetylcholinesterase inhibiting function to them. Now the brain is part of the overall nervous system, and one of the components of the nervous system, of course, is the various nerve cells or neurons. Now nerve cells require various neurotransmitters in order to transmit signals from one to another, and these are a combination of electrical signals and chemical signals. Now in healthy brain function, these various neurotransmitters, among them acetylcholine and many others, are going to have special functions in order to facilitate the exchange of neural impulses. Things can go wrong at a number of different stages, and deficiencies in neurotransmitters or an overabundance of neurotransmitters can all cause various problems ranging from cognitive deficits, similar to Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, to behavioral and mood disorders. One of the important neurotransmitters is acetylcholine. Now, without getting too deep in the weeds, the fact of the matter is acetylcholine helps the interchange of information between nerve cells. Let's put it in simple terms. So when nerve cells communicate, the level of these various neurotransmitters has to be optimal. In a healthy brain, you're going to have acetylcholine functioning to help the exchange of impulses between various neurons. Now, as part of the brain's normal chemistry, the brain also has a chemical in it called acetylcholinesterase. Now, the function of acetylcholinesterase is to break acetylcholine down. Once the acetylcholine has done its job, the acetylcholinesterase comes in, breaks the acetylcholine down, and then the body is able to remanufacture these chemicals at a future time. You can think of it like a built-in recycling system in the brain for neurotransmitters. In healthy brain chemistry, 
there will be an optimal balance or something close to an optimal balance between acetylcholine, acetylcholinesterase, and the whole process is more or less functional, within ranges, obviously. In the brain of a person who is suffering from Alzheimer's, one of the things that researchers have noticed is that there is a deficiency in acetylcholine. And what researchers have surmised is that the brain of a person who has Alzheimer's disease, part of the damage that Alzheimer's disease does is to reduce the brain's ability to create or to synthesize to generate acetylcholine. The upshot of this is that the brain is deficient in acetylcholine because number one, the brain is producing less of it, and number two, the acetylcholinesterase is working still to break down the acetylcholine that is there. Now, I'm going to break in for just a minute and remind viewers that the cause of Alzheimer's disease is not well understood. There is no one definitive cause that has been agreed on by researchers. There are a number of hypotheses. The acetylcholine deficiency hypothesis is one of those. There are numerous others. Some of the other factors that are included in a study of Alzheimer's disease are going to be the various plaques and tangles, some of which form on the neurons themselves and others which form in between the neurons and interrupt the ability of the neurons to communicate many other kinds of hypothesis as well. You can check out, I'll put a link in the description, you can check out my video on causation in terms of the hypotheses that are suggested for Alzheimer's disease. I won't repeat all that information here, but it's relevant because when we're thinking about what it is that causes Alzheimer's disease, one hypothesis is that it is a deficiency in acetylcholine. If the body is unable to produce acetylcholine, one of the interventions that researchers have come up with to try to boost acetylcholine levels is to tinker around with the acetylcholinesterase. And that process is going to work something like this. In a brain that is deficient in acetylcholine, somehow the brain has been damaged through whatever means, possibly through plaques and tangles, possibly through something else, but the brain is now producing less acetylcholine than it was before. Then researchers have basically said, let's introduce some kind of an inhibiting factor on the acetylcholinesterase. The idea behind that is that if they can take the acetylcholinesterase and inhibit its function, then the idea is there's going to be more acetylcholine available in the brain because they have reduced the brain's ability to break it down. Now, what's interesting about this intervention is that it doesn't attempt directly to boost the amount of acetylcholine that the brain is producing. It doesn't attempt to add in acetylcholine. I think some researchers have attempted to supplement directly with choline and acetylcholine. My impression, and again, this is an untutored impression, is that some of these things are broken down in the stomach so that they don't actually arrive orally absorbed acetylcholine may be very poorly absorbed and doesn't end up in the brain where it needs to be. Another challenge that, that researchers run into is the blood-brain barrier, which is very efficient at keeping chemicals out. It can sometimes obstruct researchers' abilities to put additional chemicals into the brain that they're trying to use as an intervention for Alzheimer's disease. But essentially here, what's being done is in that cycle between the body creating acetylcholine and the body's acetylcholinesterase breaking the acetylcholine down, what researchers then are in the position of trying to do is to stop the acetylcholinesterase from breaking down the acetylcholine, and then in a kind of roundabout way, increasing the amount of acetylcholine that there is because it is inhibiting the body's ability to break it down. One final thing, it's important to understand that these drugs do not address cause. And you can kind of see it in the diagram again. If Alzheimer's is started on this hypothesis by some kind of a deficiency in the production of acetylcholine, then you can see, based on at least my understanding of this process, that these acetylcholinesterase inhibiting drugs do not address the deficit of acetylcholine directly again. They only boost it in a kind of backhanded way by suppressing the body's ability to break down the acetylcholine that there is. Now, over time, these acetylcholinesterase inhibiting drugs then 
are going to lose their effectiveness. The course of the disease will continue to get worse and eventually Alzheimer's disease is going to terminate in the patient's death, whether it is through the Alzheimer's directly, as indeed happened in the case of my dad, or through some other comorbidity that's simply a part of the normal aging process or some other ancillary cause precipitated by other effects of Alzheimer's disease. For more information on that, I invite you to see the video that I have on how a person dies from Alzheimer's disease and the question of whether or not Alzheimer's disease is a terminal illness. Once again, I am not a medical researcher. This is my untutored understanding of what an acetylcholinesterase inhibiting drug does. I hope that something that I said may have been of value to you. If it was, I ask that you like the video, subscribe to the channel, please click the notification bell to be alerted to new content as it becomes available. I thank you so much for being with me today, and I look forward to seeing you again in another video. Thank you.